Perfect. I think we can start. So good afternoon, everyone, to our next lecture here on reinforcement learning. Uh, today we're going to more or less finish model-based reinforcement learning approaches by introducing dynamic programming. So dynamic programming will be a solution method on how to solve MDPs, which we have already addressed at the end of last week. And today we are going to discuss how we can utilize dynamic programming mm -hmm to make this a little bit more in a structured way, such that we can result into optimal policy finding, optimal decision finding in rather short amount of time. However, dynamic programming, as for the entire reminder of today's lecture, I would like already to point out that this is a model-based approach. So we will always assume for today that we have full access to the underlying MDP structure in particular to the state transition probability so that we basically know how the dynamics of the system which we are trying to make optimal decisions in are working. The table of contents for today's lecture is that yeah, first we basically want to recache what dynamic programming is uh, actually on a very high conceptual level, especially also what assumptions result in uh, applying dynamic programming. Then we're going to discuss policy evaluation. So this is, we have an MDP and some policy given. We want to discuss how can we make fast predictions regarding the values and action values of this policy in the given MDP. Then policy improvement, also called control. So there we have the MDP and we want to improve our policy such that we are able to make optimal decisions. Then we are going to somehow combine these two steps, prediction and control or evaluation and improvement with a policy and value iteration. And then we are discussing some limitations and basically a little bit of motivation why we are going to leave this model-based kind of solution using dynamic programming towards data-driven mm -hmm. solutions starting from next week. Okay. So dynamic programming, as the name already says, or short DP, is basically just consisting out of two parts of a word, dynamic and programming. Dynamic, of course, refers here to our MDP structure, that we have some problem where we have some sequential or temporal kind of decisions, which will lead to temporal or sequential kind of state transitions. And programming, uh, in general frame, in that sense, that we want to math, um, optimize something in a mathematical kind of way. Further on, dynamic programming will be um, having a very large scope, so dynamic programming is not limited to finite state and action sets, as we are going to discuss it today. We can also find dynamic programming as a basic optimization concept and general optimization problems, also with respect to continuous problems, so infinite um, state spaces and action spaces, but we are going to discuss uh, as already introduced last week, only the finite MDPs where state and actions are discrete decisions and discrete states. If you would like to apply uh, the MDP solution, as we will discuss it today, uh, to a continuous kind of problem, what you could do is you could apply uh, artificial quantization that you say, okay, I have like some grids with respect to um, state values and action values, and I discretize these um, continuous values on a gridded space such to make it discrete. And what we're going to do today is we will make again, uh, make a lot of use of these value functions and state action value functions in order to recache previous solutions. And therefore, which is the basic background of um, dynamic programming is, we break our overall problem into sub-problems and recaching solutions on previous sub-problem stages. That is basically the main advantage which we have over exhaustive search algorithms or exhaustive search that I do not blindly compare all action trajectories or the full permutation about my action sequences, but that I try to recache parts of the solutions and therefore to reduce the overall function evaluations which I need to do in order to find an optimal policy. So therefore, in order to be able to apply DP, we need to have some optimality substructure. So the principle of optimality must apply and the optimal solution must be 
uh, able to be break down into subproblems. So as we have already discussed last week, if I want to find the shortest route from my current position to some other place, and I will know that maybe some intermediate place in between is definitely on the route towards the shortest problem, then I do not need to evaluate all other potential sequences not going over this intermediate city or intermediate place, but I can limit myself to such trajectories, to such solutions, where this intermediate place is definitely a good substructure. So for example, um, if you're traveling with the train from Paderborn to Frankfurt Airport, you normally know that the shortest problem will be maybe via Co uh, Cologne main station, because from Cologne main station you have the Sprinter ICE to Frankfurt uh, Airport. So therefore, you could basically break down your problem to come uh, with the train from Paderborn to Frankfurt towards the subproblem. how can I get to Cologne main station with the train or other transportation means in the shortest amount of time. So therefore, you have basically broken down your problem, Paderborn Frankfurt, into two subproblems, together with the knowledge that from Cologne, it's definitely the shortest way to go to Frankfurt via the ICE sprinter. Of course, these subproblems, there must be also somehow overlapping. So these subproblems ideally appear many times that you can recache this information. So, for example, if you're asking yourself how to get to Frankfurt Airport from multiple locations, not only starting from Paderborn, but maybe from Bielefeld or from Dortmund or whatsoever, then of course you can recache your information. Okay, from Cologne, it's definitely the fastest to Frankfurt. So then the subproblem would be recached, and you just need to basically re-ask um, yourself how to get the quickest from Bielefeld or Dortmund to Cologne, right? So in this case, this subproblem would occur many, many times. And this will make then solution algorithms particularly fast. How is this requirements of when we are able to apply dynamic programming uh, related to Markov decision problems? It is basically just a short summary of what we have introduced for Markov decision problems because MDPs fully uh, satisfy these two properties. We have the Bellman equation, which is part of the MDP formulation, which provides this recursive decomposition by the state values and state action values. So the state and state action values basically do this recaching for us, the recaching of sub solutions, and the value functions, they store this information then for us. I've also brought a little yeah, animation basically with this pass finding problem as some kind of cartoonic way, which I need to play here in Adobe. So for example, problem is here, let's uh, think you are starting in Paderborn and you want to go to Bielefeld as quick as possible and you have multiple routes via Schlossholte, Reda Wittenberg, Hornbad Meinberg, Detmold, Gütersloh. And how could we try to get the shortest route? The trival solution, which is uh, animated here in the background currently, is the exhaustive search of full enumeration. So that means that starting from Paderborn to Bielefeld, we will try, basically by trial and error, all possible routes through this limited maze or through this limited map. So all possible ways are evaluated independently from previous route evaluations. And if we do that, in total, we will require 14 segment evaluation. So a segment would be like from Paderborn to Flossholte, that we call a segment uh, evaluation. And we would need 14 segment evaluations via exhaust the search, trying all out all possible routes to find that trivially the shortest route from Paderborn to Bielefeld would be straight via Flossholte. These rewards, which we have indicated here at the edges of this simplified MDP, would then relate to the distances or to the time which is needed to get from Paderborn to Schlossholte and then to Bielefeld or here from Paderborn to Rieder, Wiedenbrück and so on. However, if we do dynamic programming, which we're going to discuss in detail today, then what we are going to do is we will try to solve the same problem, so how to get from Paderborn to Bielefeld in the shortest amount of time, but we do not brute forcely try out all different routing combinations 
but we're trying to recache, reuse previously found sub-results such that we can limit the total amounts of segment evaluations. So in this case, what we basically do is, which is a very seen, very often seen principle in dynamic programming, we basically try to flip our viewpoint to start from the end position, so here from Bielefeld, and basically try to go backwards uh, in this map and try to find the shortest amount of time which we need to go back in time. And basically what we will do is, uh, we will calculate the state values or the state action values for all the different locations and therefore we are able to basically recache the information. So for example, if you are interested on how good our way from Gütersloh to Bielefeld is via Schloss Holter and Reda Wienbrück, with the exhaustive search algorithm, we would have basically evaluated this lag and this route independently from each other. Therefore, we would evaluate this segment two times. And with dynamic programming, what we are going to do is we utilize our idea of action values or state action values. And if we know how long it takes from Gütersloh to Bielefeld, then using the state value idea, if we are able to evaluate this route and this route, we can basically recache the information which we already have for the travel between Gütersloh and Bielefeld and therefore just need to evaluate this route once and not twice. And therefore we are recaching this information. This is of course a very cartoonish, simplified approach, but it should give you just the very basic idea. We want to break down our problem into sub-problems and recache sub-solutions via the state value and action value concept. So switching back to my normal presentation mode. There we are. Okay. So therefore, what we are going to do is we will basically discuss two types of subproblems um, with model-based dynamic programming. These two types of subproblems will be also subject to all our subsequent lectures where we try to utilize or where we try to utilize different methods but trying to find the same optimal solutions. The one subtask which we are going to discuss are prediction problems. So with prediction problems, we refer to the task that we have an MDP, either known or unknown. Unknown would be then later the case with data-driven solutions. And we definitely also have a policy at hand which tells us if we're in a certain decision scenario what to do. And giving this information, we want to estimate the state values of all our states within the MDP. That would be the prediction task. So find an estimation as good as possible in order to estimate the state values of the MDP giving a policy. The other subtask which we're going to discuss today, but also during the subsequent lectures, is control. So there we would have only the MDP given, either as a known model or as an unknown model, which we need to interact with in this recursive uh, reinforcement learning data-driven kind of way. And here in the control kind of uh, task, we would try to find optimal policies, P, which lead then also to optimal value functions. Okay, so prediction and control. And we will also see already today that these two concepts are highly linked to each other, especially when it comes to finding optimal decisions, that this finding of optimal decisions will be always subject to some prediction steps. Yeah, and as of course already mentioned, dynamic programming as discussed for today will require full knowledge of the MDP, it's therefore a model-based technique, not a data-driven technique, and therefore in real-world engineering applications there might be certain limitations of dynamic programming, especially when we discuss model where the system, so model of course is always just a mathematical model of what we think how our system is operating internally, but the real system behavior can deviate from the model, right? So a mathematical model is normally not precise, it can be quite precise, but it can be also awkwardly wrong, awkwardly off, and therefore uh, wrong model knowledge will also lead to wrong decisions using dynamic programming or any other kind of optimization techniques if I do model-based predictions. 
Uh, and for some systems, we might also have not a model, model available. For example, due to cost reasons, if you're operating in some um, field of, of the economy where time is very limited in order to come up with solutions, then you might not have the time to come up with a model at all. Or if it's a very complex system which you're interacting with, then deriving a precise model might be also not possible due to lack of knowledge regarding the system internal dynamics. Okay, but we will assume for the reminder of today that this model, this MDP, is therefore, uh, is therefore given. And uh, we will also see that many of these concepts which historically evolved from dynamic programming in the 60s and 70s, that the mathematical foundations are still present in today's most reinforcement learning algorithms. And therefore, it's very good to know this, let's say, historical basics because they're still state of the art, still very important. And we will see in the subsequent lectures how we can uh, basically derive data-driven reinforcement learning concepts on the basics of dynamic programming. Okay? Okay. Any questions so far to this little introduction, to this little background on dynamic programming? Okay, good. Was, was also easy. Now comes the fun part, so policy evaluation, uh, which was also coined as prediction. So we have an MDP, we have a policy, and now the question is how can we get um, the quickest the state value out of this information? Um, of course, we have basically done this uh, more or less already last week, but today I want to give it also a different notion. So, of course, we have discussed state value is basically this expectation of the instantaneous reward plus the discounted uh, future state value of the successor state uh, in a finite MDP. Nicely, we can also write this in a vector matrix form, which basically results in a linear uh, equation with our unknown state value vector, uh, giving a reward vector and giving a state uh, probability transition matrix. So, if these two informations together with the discount factor are given, then of course I can utilize this normal equation, this linear equation, to solve for V. The problem here, of course, is that um, handling this linear equation, especially when M, so the number of states in my MDP is very large, so let's say we have a very complex system, maybe some board game or maybe some discretized uh, finite um, state and action value set of a very difficult technical system, then of course I could have millions or hundred thousands at least of different states and therefore also millions or hundred thousands of different state values, right? As many states I have, as many unknown state values I have. And let's say we have a million states, then this matrix becomes a million times a million matrix, right? And it will become the key parameter or the key information which we need to evaluate by taking the inverse partly of this matrix. And I think you can consider that taking the inverse of a one times times one uh, million uh, matrix, uh, that this will take a lot of time and depending on uh, your memory and so on, on your local computer, this might even lead to overflows in that sense of how much data you need to store during the inversion of the matrix. So therefore, what I'm going to discuss in contrast to last week with you is how can we solve this linear equation system towards this unknown state value vector without the need of explicitly taking the inverse in order to solve the equation system. So basically to do this in a somehow recursive, iterative way in order to um, get rid of this inverting of a very large matrix. And therefore, the general idea is to apply basically iterative approximations. So therefore, what we introduce is this subscript, subscript I. The subscript I now stands for our iteration count. So if I is equal zero, that would be our initial guess. Rival initial guess would be we set all state action or state values to zero, for example. And then with every increase of the iteration count, which is an integer number, we try to update our state value vector or our estimated state value vector 
that it becomes as close as possible to the final value, which we, of course, do not know beforehand. But this is just from the initial, from the idea point of view. Let's try to iterate this vector for many iterations such this error becomes zero. How can we do this? Uh, let's rewrite our Bellman equation, Bellman um, expectation equation from last week. So last week what we did, we have basically just inverted this matrix A, where we can see that the state transition probability matrix um, is present, and therefore the dimensions of this matrix will be also equal to the dimensions of this matrix, which I've called here A. And as discussed, if A has very high dimensional order, then just taking the explicit inverse might be numerically not feasible. How can I solve this uh, method by Numerical means, we have different opportunities. We could utilize general gradient descent, a variant of it, which is called Richardson iteration, which is basically also uh, some variant of a gradient descent algorithm or subspace methods. However, in the context of reinforcement learning, traditionally, the Richardson iteration has become most prominent, so we will have a peek into this method more specifically. However, the other methods here would also be perfectly fine. They just follow the same idea. Let's try to iterate over the state value vector to have a very efficient calculation without calculating the explicit inverse. So, how is the Richardson iteration? The Richardson iteration is already uh, pointed out here in equation 3.3. Uh, it's basically something which should also remind you on gradient descent, very similar. Um, this is our normal equation which we want to solve. A times C is equal B. Reminder, A is this basically our matrix describing our system dynamics. C is our unknown state value. And B is our right-hand reward vector, which we assume to be also known beforehand. Right? So we know this, we know this, this is unknown. So we want to solve, therefore, for C. And in the Richardson iteration, we basically have uh, this iterative algorithm, which we can proceed for some time until the error between or the differences between Xi plus 1 and Xi are minimal. And the iteration regulation here is that between Xi plus 1 and Xi, we basically add this error here, B times A times Ca, which is basically the error if I uh, bring in yeah, the uh, A times C on the other side of the equation, that this error for some iterative count will be put on top of the previous iteration and therefore try to minimize the error between the left-hand side and the right-hand side of this normal equation over time. Right? So this really reminds us on gradient descent. And we do this for a couple of times. And eventually, if we do everything right, after, let's say, a couple of iterations, i, we will see that xi i and xi i plus 1 is basically identical. So there will be no changes anymore between two iterations. And if that is the case, we can basically abort our algorithm. And we then have found a sufficiently well numerical approximation of our state action value or state value in this case without the need of really calculating the matrix inverse. Question is about convergence, of course. Um, if we do this, let's say, step-like changes of our state value vector here over time, we could, of course, also ask the question, is that converging always, or might be, uh, might be there any case where um, this series, which we basically uh, have written down here, diverges and the state values go completely out of the roof and we come to a wrong approximation. Therefore, what we're going to do quite quickly, uh, not so complicated, we are going to discuss the approximation error and with approximation error we basically refer to the difference between the true state value vector and the estimated state value vector at some uh, iteration count i, and we basically then just plug in our equation from here, and we will find that the error evaluation, the error rule over time, 
is EI plus one, so the approximation error on the next iteration stage is identical to the previous error in the iteration state i times this matrix, identity matrix minus w times a, or omega, with w, omega. This factor omega here, I've not mentioned this so far, this is a scalar parameter which we can consider something like a step size, right? So if we take w quite large, then of course this arrow between the left hand and the right hand side will be scaled quite significantly, so we will go a large step from i to i plus one, or if omega is quite small, then of course we have a small step size, and this arrow between left hand and right hand side will be scaled down, and we will might need some more time. So therefore we can also raise the question, how should we evaluate, or how should we set this omega such that the series definitely converges and does not diverge? Therefore we can inspect the following norm, so the uh, infinity norm over this vector, and uh, in order to find out if this error series, so this right hand side here of our um, error series evaluation, if this is bounded or could get potentially unbounded. In order to do so, we can introduce the following um, inequality approximation. Um, so basically here on the right hand side, what we can basically do is the upper uh, approximation of this would be that we multiply the uh, matrix norm of this matrix times the vector norm of this vector, which will be uh, larger or identical to the previous multiplication where both are inside the same norm, right? If I split this up and multiply it with each other, it will be definitely some multiplication of two positive numbers. And in this sense, this approximation towards uh, an upper equilibrium, uh, an, uh, an upper inequality is definitely given. So, now if we have a look at this uh, equation, of course, we can basically find out, okay, this will be here some, some starting error, right, EI, this will be just our starting error at the zeros iteration, and the question is, does this norm here, does this uh, become a bounded number, or might this diverge? So the question is, is this norm limited or not? Uh, if this is smaller than one, of course, then this error will uh, also um, iterate towards zero. If this would be one, of course, the error would not go down. If that would be greater than one, then of course, the error will increase over time and over time. So therefore, what we can do is, now we can just plug in our um, A matrix here, which was basically the state transition probability matrix times gamma and the identity vector, so we get this. Um, and then, for sake of simplicity, we can just set uh, omega to one, because in this case, what we can do very simply is if we set omega to one, then this uh, identity matrix here basically just vanishes, which is quite comfortable, and what we result in would be just a gamma times the state transition probability matrix, Gamma is a scalar, so we can put it outside this norm. And then the question is, what about the norm of this um, matrix? And the nice thing is that the state transition probability matrix, if you remember, in one row of the state transition probability matrix, we have uh, this, the state transition probabilities to travel from one state to the another state. And in one row, there are all states transition probabilities for the specific starting state which we are looking in. So if we sum this up in the finite MDP, this has to be always one, right? Because otherwise it would be a not, you know, validly defined MDP, because otherwise there would be not, you know, uh, some uh, sensible uh, idea of probabilities. And therefore we can find out that this norm of the state transition probability matrix is one, of course, the sum of the, the rows is always one. And therefore, the question is, is our discounting factor gamma smaller than one? And therefore, what we have now found out that the Richardson iteration will always converge for MDPs if our discounting factor is so, yeah, so to speak active, it's smaller than one, even if our step size omega is set to one, right? Of course, you could play around with these two values, 
uh, this is here just for omega equals 1 to make our convergence analysis a little bit easier. If uh, omega becomes larger than 1, of course, this inequality constraint here will become a little bit more difficult. But this is basically just to show you, okay, even for this very large or significantly large step size, that this will converge. Okay? Um, good. Then, what we can now do is, we have therefore discussed the convergence properties of the Richardson iteration to find the state value without explicitly calculating the result from this normal equation. And what we can now do is, we can apply the Richardson iteration to specifically our state value problem, right? So that means that we will basically apply this Richardson iteration equation to our state value problem. And this is basically done here, or in shorter notation, matrix vector notation here. So 3.11 and 3.12 are basically identical. Um, and what we basically get now is the Richardson iteration applied to the state value uh, MDP uh, formulation via the Bellman expectation equation. And what we basically get is a very simple equation where we just apply the state value estimate at the previous uh, iteration. We multiply it with the state transition matrix times gamma plus our uh, reward vector. And this would be then our state value vector estimate for the next iteration. So very easy. We just need to plug in uh, the iteration here in this equation, and we would be able over time to iteratively do policy evaluation. So to iteratively find the state value vectors. What we do here is then basically also again bootstrapping in that sense that um, when we apply the Richardson iteration, what we're going to do is we will do a full synchronous backup of our state value vector. So what I refer to this by full synchronous backup means, synchronous means that all the state value estimates, which are saved inside the state value vector, are updated at once, right? We update the complete vector in one shot. And we do this for all states in one step, so full synchronous backup. And this is then, of course, also, um, again, as we have introduced this already last week, something which we call bootstrapping, because as illustrated by this backup diagram, what we basically do is we update the state value estimates in the next iteration via the state value estimates of all other states from the previous iteration. So we basically try to update an estimate based on a previous estimate, right? So that is what we refer to bootstrapping. We use estimates to update estimates and basically try to recache information also here for this prediction problem. Bootstrapping. Yeah, so that's what I've already meant. We update VI plus 1 on the basis of all other estimates, which is called bootstrapping. And you have the Richardson inter. Uh, Richardson iteration can be interpreted as gradient descent algorithm that we have already discussed, and it leads to full synchronous backups because we basically back up all the state space in one shot. This is also called an expected update. This is something which I've not uh, discussed so far, which is basically due to the fact that we are utilizing the Bellman uh, equation, the Bellman um, expectation equation, uh, utilizing the full model knowledge, right? So we will also see that uh, in the next lectures we are not using expected updates but sample-based updates, but here we are using so-called expected updates because we take the expectation over the entire state space using the MDP. Okay, let's do this again for our um, example, which we have introduced uh, the previous weeks, which is the forest tree example. And I would like to apply the Richardson iteration to our um, forest tree MDP, where we had this random policy, this 50-50 policy. So with equal likelihood in every state, we either will cut down the tree or we will wait in the hope that the tree or the forest will grow. For this setup last week, 
uh, just recaching this same problem, we had already calculated the state transition probabilities for this policy, as well as the reward distribution over the state space for this policy, right? So this is why this is here with the uh, subscript, um, with the superscript pi, because this is already considering our policy. And now for this state transition probability and for this reward um, vector, what we are going to do is we will just apply our Richardson iteration, we have some chalk here. So what we're going to do is now, vi plus one is equal to our reward vector plus gamma times state transition probability times vi hat, right? So this was the Richardson iteration for the state value problem. And in order to start, we need an initial guess, right? So this is an iterative equation. We need an initial guess for our state values. And as already briefly mentioned, trivial initial guess mm -hmm. would be, if you do not know anything about the state values, you would just state every state value is zero. If you have pre-knowledge about state values or the system you're operating, of course, you could also try to set up the initial values differently, such that you can try to converge quicker. Okay, let's do the first real iteration. Um, if we apply the Richardson iteration, we can first find that for the first real iteration, this vi is zero, right? Because our initial guess is zero. So therefore, in the first real iteration, this part of the equation is basically completely zero. And what is remaining is basically just our reward vector, right? So that's why we see that this point five, one, two, and zero is basically our reward vector flipped. Okay. In the second iteration, of course, now we plug in vi hat from the first iteration, multiply it with our state transition probability matrix, discount, not forget to discount, and we add again our reward vector to it, which results then in this equation, or these numbers, not this equation. And we can then do this many, many times um, until infinitely many evaluations, of course, practically maybe 10 or something like this evaluation would be more than enough. We would find our final state value estimates with sufficient accuracy without the need to explicitly solving the normal equation by matrix inversion. Okay, and we of course can also see that from one iteration to the next iteration, the, the delta, the change of the state value estimate gets also smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, so therefore this result, what we see here in table 3.1, especially the last line, this is basically just the same information, the same knowledge, which we have obtained from last week. Uh, it is basically just another way to get there and motivation for this would be we can do this for very large MDPs where matrix inversion is not an option. Okay, so if your computer cries for memory overflow then this would be your potential uh, backup plan to go with such an iterative structure. However, we can still improve ourselves in that sense that um, especially if you want to do this for many, many states, so for millions of states, of course, um, this also takes time, right? So we need to do like um, a vector matrix multiplication. So if this is a vector with one million elements and this is a matrix with one million times one million elements, also these multiplications and additions here, they will be computationally expensive. So we want that this series converges as quick as possible because then I need to calculate less often these very big matrix uh, vector multiplications. And what can we do there is basically a variant which we can call in-place variant. Idea is here still the same, so we apply the Richardson iteration. But what we do is 
we do not do it for all states in one shot, so that we do this full state vector times state transition probability matrix uh, multiplication, um, and then add it up here, but we basically do it in a step-by-step -step evaluation that basically, if this is a vector, vi plus one with n elements, this is our reward vector, So in the in-place updates, what we're actually going to do is we will calculate first the multiplication of this vector with the first row of our state transition matrix. We will add up after discounting the reward. And what we can then do is we can update this element here, right? And the in-place updates then basically do the following. They take this update and already put it back into the right-hand side of the Richardson equation. And then when we calculate the second row of the Richardson iteration to update vi plus one second element, then we can already utilize the previous information, the previous update on the first updated element of this state value estimate. And then we do this iteratively um, again and again. So this is basically the idea that as we have to do this multiplication normally in somehow sequential kind of way, that we already utilize uh, available intermediate information between full iterations of the Richardson iteration. And of course, uh, you can either do this top down, as I've said, right? So we can start basically with multiplying this vector with this matrix from top down to update these elements top down and then bring them back here on the right hand side but you can also change the order in your personal way so if you know like let's see how the mdp dynamics look like okay maybe it is a good idea to start with states which are very important which have a very central um yeah meaning central impact on the mdp structure let's update first the line of this uh, Richardson iteration, which is referring to the more important states, update them first, and then move on to the states which are less important in order to utilize this degree of freedom in which order to do the updates such that you can converge quicker. Okay? At the end, of course, uh, in one Richardson iteration, you need to update all the state values once, but how you get there within these in-place uh, variants, you can basically design by yourself. And what I've tried to sketch here on the blackboard is basically just this algorithm visualized where here basically in this line, uh, what we basically do is here, we update the Richardson iteration, not for all states, but for one state. And we can do this for all states in a more or less arbitrary order. And as discussed previously, we do this such that our difference between two iteration counts is such small that we can abort our approximation, right? So this would be basically just an abortion kind of um, evaluation such that our approximation error has become sufficiently small. So if we do this again with our uh, forest tree MDP, and we utilize our degrees of freedom to uh, basically start from back to front. So we start with updating our last states first and then do the updates to the previous earlier states. So state one was the small tree, state two was the medium tree, state three was the large tree, 
in stage four was this gone status where the entire forest was chopped down either by mankind or by uh, some kind of, of disaster. Um, so our zeroist iteration would be still the same, right? So this is just our initial guess. We think these are our state values. And then we do the Richardson iteration back to front. So here for the uh, last state, of course, nothing changes because in the state transition probability matrix of the last state, we will basically find the information that this can only transist to the last state, which is zero. And the reward to stay in the last state is also zero because we did not have any degrees of freedom. So this is why this stands here for zero. Then for the second last state, state number three, we again do the Richardson iteration. This would be zero from the previous iteration. And what we will get here is just the reward information, the two. So this is also identical up to now to the standard Richardson iteration. But now what is happening is that we use these invariant updates. So when we update uh, V for the second state, we can already utilize that previously we have updated already the state value information for state number three. And likewise, if we update the state value information for state number one, we can already consider that we have updated these two state values previously. And if we do so, so if you compare at home or on your tablet or whatsoever, this table from the standard full synchronous Richardson backup iteration to this invariant uh, update um, yeah, variant of it, you will see that especially these earlier states will benefit from the Richardson iteration such that we will converge to the true state values much quicker. Okay, same values down here. So the final result is of course the same. This row is identical, but we will come to the final result a little bit quicker with sufficient accuracy. Okay. So on, on this level, I do not really have much more to say to the policy evaluation because with the introduction of MDPs as a problem structure and the idea of state and action values, we more or less already have implicitly introduced dynamic programming. And now we have basically just introduced a little extension to dynamic programming to policy evaluation or slash prediction that we're trying to do this numerically, maybe less costly than standard matrix inversion. But the goal is basically the same. We want to get knowledge about all state values or state action values of the MDP giving a policy. Here we have done this for uh, state values, but as discussed last week when we introduced MDPs, we can do the same for state action values, uh, but for sake of time and because it's you know, more or less the same equations, uh, we do not do this here on the whiteboard again. Okay, so any questions to policy evaluation Wire Richardson iteration. Fits, right? Good. Then policy improvement. So policy improvement or control. Question is, um, let's say we have some state value estimates, V pi, for a given MVP. Um, so we have some previous policy, maybe an initial policy just a random policy or whatsoever. And we know the state values of those policies using, for example, Richardson iteration. Another question is how can we actually improve our policy over time, such that we can find an optimal policy. And also an important question which we're going to discuss uh, based on this question is, um, what's about the optimal policy? When did we find the optimal policy? Okay. And um, therefore, of course, we will basically uh, utilize, um, again, a concept from last week, but in a little bit different notion. So the idea of policy improvement is quite simple. The idea is if, why are the state values or state action values, we have basically recached already all the information about um, the, the, um, results from doing certain decisions in our MTP, in our MTP, then it is sufficient to evaluate what will happen if in a certain situation I will just do one different 
decision, one different action in comparison to my usual policy. And then I can compare what for results this different action will have in contrast to my previous policy and then can make up my mind if this different action, this different policy in contrast to my previous policy results in better or worse or equal state values, state action values as before. And using this idea of dynamic programming, that means that we can do this basically in a step-by-step -step manner. We don't need to evaluate the entire problem, like in this exhaustive search kind of approach again, but we just need to evaluate this one decision which we make differently than before, and using the substructure of MDPs and using the state and action values, we can just evaluate a single decision making process without the need of evaluating everything once again. And in order to do so, we will of course make use of our state action values again. But now we have to uh, have a very uh, close look here. Um, here in this state action value eval or notion, what we basically do is we take the expectation about the instantaneous reward plus the discounted uh, future uh, state value of the successor state, but this action here, this UK, this can be from a different policy in comparison to policy pi, which is our standard policy, right? So therefore this equation is set or is to be read in this way, what is the state action value of being a state x, applying action u, action u can be arbitrarily, it doesn't have to be in line with policy pi, but then we assume after doing this one arbitrary action, that again after this, we follow again policy pi, and therefore we can just consider, okay, what foreign difference it will have if we do the single action differently than before, and then after this just following the policy pi, right? Of course, in the state value, we have basically recached all the information about how the state value will be under this policy. And therefore, if we assume that after taking this action, we are still within the policy pi, then we can reutilize the substructure problem of MDPs and do not need to reevaluate everything again. Right? And this will lead to the so called policy improvement theorem, which we will also. Uh, proof on the, on the next slide, but let's discuss it first. Um, the policy improvement theorem says if for any deterministic policy, so this is a short um, limitation for the moment, so we think of policy pi being deterministic and policy pi dash, if we find that the state action value follows in policy pi and doing this one action differently, right? So this would be the action here, it is this action here, Following, following another policy, pi dash, is better or equal than the state values of our previous policy for all states of the state space, then we know that policy pi dash must be as good as, or if this is a true better indication, better than the old policy pi. And therefore, if we would switch over to policy p, uh, pi dash, that in this case also our state values would be greater or equal to the previous policy. This is the policy improvement theorem, which uh, basically tells us that um, due to this substructure problem, we can evaluate the usefulness, the advantage of a single action independently from all other actions. Okay? And we will also prove the theorem just on the next slide because it's a very important theorem. And then after this proof, we will also um, derive a very important implicit finding from this policy improvement theorem, which I do not want to uh, say now, but in just two minutes, okay? So policy improvement theorem basically tells us if we find any policy pi dash, which leads to better or equal state values, in contrast to the previous policy, then it is globally identical or even better than the performance of the previous policy. Okay, how can we prove that? 
um, basically by just applying the knowledge about MDPs, which we already have. So first line of the proof is basically just the assumption from the previous slide, right? So we have some uh, previous policy pi, and our assumption is that the Q value of this policy for an action which is taken from a different policy, pi dash, is better or equal, right? So this is just the previous um, assumption. The state action value, of course, we have a formal definition for this, right? So state action value is expectation over instantaneous reward plus discounted value uh, of the successor state with the difference now that the policy action for this one single step comes from the new policy pi dash. And of course, this is the same as the expectation of a policy pi dash for the reward which is then subject to policy pi dash, whereas the state value of the successor state, of course, is still subject to the previous policy. Then I can basically just reapply our concept, our policy theorem, improvement theorem, once again. So from here to here, what we have basically just applied again is this inequality for v pi, right? But now, not for the initial state, but for the successor state, right? So v pi is exchanged against q pi for the successor state, and we apply again uh, the assumption that the next state comes from the new policy pi dash, okay? So we have basically, from here to here, we have just reapplied our initial assumption of the policy theory. And then again, for the Q value of the successor state, we can then write down again the formal definition of the Q value from MDPs. We can again rewrite this and again and again and again. And what we basically find out that we can do this recaching and re uh, inequality um, findings can be done, redone and redone until we are actually able to write down this entire series of discounted future rewards with respect to the policy pi dash. And therefore, this is here our return definition, right? And therefore, the return definition being in some state x is the state value of the successor policy pi dash. And this therefore must be better than our initial policy pi, right? So therefore, the policy improvement theorem basically um, can be just proven by the application of the MDP settings straight away and just by recursively reapplying our known equation. Okay. However, what we have done so far is we have uh, applied the policy improvement theorem only for a single state, right? If I go back, this inequality is basically set for a single starting state. But of course, we want to do this not for only a single starting state, but for all states, right? So for the entire state space. And what we call this is a greedy policy improvement, where we basically try to improve our policy, pi dash, for any um, state of the state space. And uh, we basically ask here for the argument of the maximum expectation of the state action values being in some state x and with some action u of k, right? So if we would try to make this greedy policy improvement for all states, then we would basically try to improve our best possible actions uh, using the uh, policy improvement theory, okay? So this is basically already a similar finding as we have found it from last week. So basically what we do is we just recache the information from the previous policy pi and we just look from the, from the viewpoint of the previous policy, is there any better action which I can take in a certain state? And if yes, I will take this action, right? So therefore, what we basically use is the knowledge about the MDP, which is already stored in the state action value Q of pi, will be used in order to improve towards a new policy pi dash. 
right? This allows us for incremental policy improvements over time, going from one policy change to the other and recaching all our previous knowledge without losing it. And therefore also the, the takeaway message of this argmax is again, basically if we are able to find very good approximations, very good knowledge about the state action values, we have basically solved our MDP, right? Because the state action value basically tells us if you're in a certain state and you have a discrete number, a limited number of discrete actions, just search for the action which has the highest Q value and this is then leading to your optimal policy. And of course, we can also do this likewise for the state values. On the previous slide, we have done it for the state action values. Uh, of course, in this case, we need to do a one-step look-ahead prediction that we say, okay, if this is our current state in which we are, and the state value which belongs to it, then we, of course, need to evaluate one-step predictions, basically looking for the instantaneous rewards which we get, plus the discounted future state value of the successor state. And this would then, again, lead to optimal actions. If, however, we find out that between two policy improvement steps, right? So policy improvement basically applies to, we do these maximization steps. So we sweep over the entire state space. We basically look for better options. And where we find state action values or state values one, with additional one-step predictions, which are better than our previous policy, then we exchange the policy at this point. And if we find out that we are not able to find better options, better decisions, higher state action values as previously for the entire state space, then of course we have also come to the conclusion that there is no better policy. We have been not able between one iteration and the next iteration to improve our policy any further so therefore, the current policy which we already have must be the optimal one. And um, the policy improvement theorem, which we have proven so far, uh, we have done this only for deterministic policies. However, there is also a proof available, which we do not go through here today due to time constraints, also for stochastic policies. Uh, you can also find this in the recommended lecture books. However, the, the main Takeaway message which I would like to utilize here from the policy improvement theorem, utilizing dynamic programming, so utilizing the full knowledge about the MDP is that you, if you do the uh, greedy policy improvements and you find out that the greedy policy improvements did not utilize to a better policy, that you can find the optimal policy and that in finite MDPs there is always an optimal policy. So this is basically the, 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 the most important key takeaway message from today, to be honest. If we have an MDP, which has finite states and finite actions, using greedy C policy improvement steps will always lead to an optimal policy. So therefore, finite MDPs are always solvable. For the large MDPs, it's just a question of how much computing time you can invest in order to solve the problem, but from a mathematical standpoint, a theoretical standpoint, finite MDPs are always fully solvable and with enough computation time, we can always get to the optimal policy. And this is a direct consequence out of the policy improvement theorem for finite MDPs. And this is very nice in that sense that here we have derived this and have proven the policy improvement theorem by dynamic programming and full model knowledge, right? So we, we assume that we have full access to the MDP dynamics. However, that also means that if starting from next week on, when we use data-driven methods, that we will always also be able to find optimal policies as long as these data-driven methods are able to basically estimate the dynamics or estimate the state values of the system which we're interacting with as uh, good as possible um, such that the estimates are 
uh, good approximations of the true MDP dynamics, and then the policy improvement theorem again applies and basically tells us that even with data-driven methods, we are able to find the optimal state action values and therefore the optimal policies in finite MDPs. And that's very important, uh, the, the most important part of today's lecture, because this guarantee will then also apply for data-driven methods, which we will discuss later throughout the lectures. Okay. Any questions to this one? So this is basically the most important bullet point of today. Maybe I go back quickly to this slide. Um, I hope we will, we will see some example with the first three MDP just in a couple of minutes. Um, I haven't prepared an example here for the uh, policy improvement on itself because I wanted to discuss it first on a conceptual level. But I hope that you really see the, the, the tribal information from this slide or from the, from the next slide, which we have already seen, that if I want to improve my policy, that this is really like, a, it's a trivial step, right? So we just compare our state, val state values or state action values, which we have on the table, and we basically just search for all state action values which are optimal in a certain state. And if we find out that multiple actions lead to the same state action value, then of course it's like flipping a coin, right? So if you have like three actions which have the same, exactly the same state action values, then it doesn't matter because it will indicate that all three of them will lead to the same degree of optimal decision. Um, and therefore you can just choose any of them basically leading to a stochastic uh, decision so choice with three decisions at the same likelihood, okay? But therefore, this policy improvement, the greedy and policy improvement step is really like tribal. Okay. Now, um, we have basically discussed these two things separately, right? So first step was, here's the MDP, here's the policy, I won't have to state the values. Second step was now, here's the MDP, uh, here's a previous policy, improve my policy, and try to find an optimal one. Um, and now we want to bring this together. Because if we go back here, if we want to do greedy policy improvement, we need information about the state values from the previous policy. And therefore, in the policy and value iteration context, what we now are going to do is we basically just going to combine these two steps, which is all about policy and also then later uh, value iteration. So basically what we find under the term policy iteration is that we will combine policy evaluation and policy improvement in that sense that if we are starting with some initial policy pi zero, that using prediction, we will try to estimate all the state values or state action values given this policy. Then we will do greedy improvement steps so for all states within the state space, we will try to find better decisions than previously. So we will change our policy. When we have changed our policy pi one, then of course our value estimates, they are not valid anymore, right? This v pi zero applies to the state values giving the policy pi zero, right? So therefore I need to reevaluate my state values, I need to do another prediction step, improve my estimates again, take into consideration that pi 1 might be different from pi 0, and after that can it again do a greedy policy improvement step and so on. Right, so we just bring together these two ideas, prediction and control, policy evaluation and policy improvement in one step. And due to the policy improvement theory, which we have seen, uh, in the previous section, we are able to eventually do this as many times as we have seen that between two policy improvement steps, there has been no change, state action values are identical, policy is identical, and if we do not see any improvement anymore between two iterations, 
we know that we have come up to the um, uh, optimal policy and we do uh, need not to continue any further. Okay? Um, in this classical policy iteration, which we will also see in the next slide with the first 3 MDP, these are full evaluations. So that means when we have changed the policy from pi 0 to pi 1, the classical policy uh, improvement basically means that we will need to update our state values completely, right? So that would mean that we will run for the new policy so many Richardson iterations or the explicit solution by the matrix inverse such that we have a very accurate with negligible error state value estimates which we can then utilize to get a new policy improvement. The value iteration, which we will see just in a couple of minutes, will basically combine this idea of the Richardson iteration together with the policy improvement that when we change our policy only a little bit between two steps, that we might do not need to do a full backup, a full update of our state value estimates because if our policy only changes a little, maybe just some of the numbers here have changed a little, so therefore, it might not be suitable to have like a full re-evaluation of the state values, but just an iterative small change, a small update of the uh, state value. But in the classical context of policy uh, iteration, this would be a full update. So v pi 0 would be a full state update based on pi 0. v pi 1 would be a full state value uh, prediction update based on the previous policy and so on. Okay. But let's do this for our Forest Tree MDP. So we are in our setting from last week, no changes here. We have our four states again, um, small, medium, large trees, no trees at all. And again, in any of these three states, we have our two decisions to cut down or to wait in the hope that the forests will grow. And now using policy iteration, so evaluation, improvement, evaluation, improvement, we are going to find an optimal policy in this MDP again, but now in this, let's say, very structured way, right? So this idea of policy evaluation and policy improvement is very general. We do not need any information about the MDP structure. Last week, if you remember, we have basically manually written down the optimization problem, we have manually solved the optimization problem, we had to try to use, yeah, not symmetry, but certain characteristics about the MDP, using the knowledge that the final state of the MDP is a special state and so on. So that also led to an optimal decision making, but it basically needed a lot of, you know, a lot of manual labor, especially if you consider to do this with very large MDPs with millions of states. The policy iteration procedure here does not need this, let's say, special knowledge or special attention of the MDP. It can be just run straight away. And we will do this now for our uh, first three MDP. And we will do this with two different initial policies, right? So we had stated that we need some initial policy, which we're going to evaluate first, and then we're going to improve this policy, evaluate, improve, evaluate, improve. Starting policy, uh, first, which I would like to evaluate from as a starting point, I've called the tree hater policy. Um, and the tree hater policy, of course, they uh, have a lot of access uh, and they will just cut down everything in all states, right? So, independently from our state, X is coming out of the wagon and they will cut down everything. So, if we do this and do policy evaluation, so that means for example, using the Richardson iteration and evaluate a couple of times until we see that the estimates are sufficiently well approximated, that with this three header policy, our state, act, our state values for policy pi zero would be one, two, three, zero. So somehow coincidence, first state, second state, third state, last state, right? So that's how to write this. Then we have to do policy improvement, right? So policy improvement means we do these one step ahead predictions 
and we are asking for the biggest action or state action value in a certain decision. And therefore, what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate the different opportunities now and we'll basically find out that, yeah, maybe let's do this manually. Um, so for, let's say, the first state, for state number one, what we can do is basically x1, we would have the reward of, this would be waiting, this would be cutting. In the waiting context, what we would basically get is a reward as zero plus discounting. I think we have set the discounting to 0.8 plus the state value of the successor state. And if we wait, that would be then the successor state would be here the second state, which is times two. So this would be then 1.6. And for the cutting branch in the first state, we would get a reward of one plus the discounted successor state value. And if I cut down everything, we will basically get a state value of zero. And this would be then, of course, one. And Um, if I do this, of course, what we can see is now that the waiting action leading to state action value of 0.6 is indeed larger as the cutting action of 1. So therefore, the greedy policy improvement has told us that for the first state, where the trees are still young and small, waiting seems to be the better option. Okay, we can do this greedy policy, greedy policy evaluations then leading to greedy policy improvements also for the two other states where we have true actions, right? The fourth state we do not need to evaluate because we do not have any action there. But if we do this for the two other states, then you will basically find out that uh, in the second state as well as in the third state, the cutting action is still optimal. So. From here to here, we have basically a small policy change, right? So the last two states actions are identical, cutting, cutting, but the first one is changed from cutting to waiting. So therefore, we know that this was not an optimal policy because there had been a policy change, right? Due to policy improvement, a greedy policy improvement step. So then we do in the policy iteration scheme, again, policy prediction. So we take the Richardson iteration, for example, and calculate the state values for all um, the uh, policies again, uh, for, the, for the new policy again. We'll calculate the um, new uh, state values following the new policy. And then what we do is we do greedy policy improvement once again. Um, and what we would find there, if we do this, you know, binary search for either waiting or cutting, is that the state action values for waiting, cutting, and cutting in the third, second, and the first state are untouched now. So therefore, what we have seen is that the policy candidate pi 2 is identical after the policy improvement step to policy candidate pi 1. And therefore, pi 1 or pi 2, however you would like to name them or order them, is the optimal policy. Because we have no change from this policy improvement step to the previous one. Okay? And I hope that from this simple evaluation here, um, you see again the simplicity of this idea of recaching solutions in MDPs. We have our two decisions and we just binary, so of course it's two here, we just need to binary compare if decision one is optimal or decision two is optimal 
without the need at this point of time to evaluate all other decisions together in a sequence, but this is completely independent, right? So we evaluate the options which we have for state one independently from the options which we have in state two, independently from the options which we have in state number three, right? We could also ask ourselves, what is if we first wait, wait, cut, right? This would be like a sequence of decisions which would be different from cut, wait, cut, or something like this, right? Which would be not possible because if we cut down something, we will go into the final state, but let's say wait, wait, and then cut, and something like this. So, right, so instead of evaluating complete trajectories of decisions leading to this exhaustive search, we do decision by decision comparisons, and therefore we do not need to do so many calculations. Okay. What I would like also to point out to you is um, that the policy iteration scheme, this iterative policy iteration scheme, is independent from our initial policy in finite MDPs, because the policy improvement theorem gives us this guarantee that we will be always able to find an optimal policy. And therefore, what we're going to do is we just reuse the same example, same problem, same parameters, everything same. The only thing which we change now is our initial policy, and instead of putting out the axis, we will hug the trees uh, as a starting policy. And therefore, in all the states, we're just going to wait. Okay? So no X cutting, but hugging. For this hugging policy, uh, we can then again do predictions. So we calculate all the state values, do policy uh, improvement, then based on these state values for our initial policy. And what we're going to find out is here that already the state values using cutting for the next, second, and third state is better than our initial policy where we want to wait at every point of time. With this new policy, we can then again do policy evaluation, do a second policy improvement step, and basically come up with the same final policy, waiting, cutting, cutting, coming to the same state values and the same finding that this is the optimal policy, right? So therefore, in a very broad kind of, of comparison to quadratic programming or quadratic optimization, this will always lead to the one global optimal policy, right? Independently from where I start. What we can now do is also some improvements to this idea. Um, so, in contrast to policy iteration, where I had a, a full prediction and a full policy improvement, what we can do is value iteration, which is basically the same but different in that sense that we try to do both steps in one. So, we don't, we don't want to do policy improvement and then prediction, but we basically want to do one step out of this, which we call value iteration. And that is basically seen here that um, also use, using this idea of invariance updates, as we have discussed previously today, is that uh, in an iterative way, we are trying to optimize our state values by greedy policy improvements, but we do this for each state independently from each other and basically utilize this idea of invariance updates, which we had for the Richardson iteration, now also for the policy improvement step. And by doing so, we do not need to have those full backup over all state values and the full improvements uh, over all possible states, but we basically do this in one shot in a step-by-step -step evaluation. This value iteration can be also summarized here on this pseudocode. It is basically um, just a summary of what we have seen on the previous slide. Here again is basically this invariant style of update uh, of the state values uh, with the state values and then using this arc max operator over our MDP structure again. We would be able to come up with a deterministic policy, pi star, which does not need the state value prediction and information separately from each other. Let's do this also in a little example in our state um, 
value problem of the forest tree MDP. So basically what we will do is, again, utilize our um, um, initial guess uh, that the state values are always zero. Then we will apply the greedy policy improvements, leading to zero, of course, for the last state. Here, for the first, uh, for the large tree state, we already find out that cutting is important or optimal. Then, based on this knowledge here, in this invariant update, uh, in-place updates, we can already find out that in the second state, it is also good to do cutting. And then in the first state, to do basically um, the waiting in order to get this uh, hopefully larger uh, reward series here. And therefore, after the first real iteration with value iteration, we have also come to the true policy, which is more or less the true optimal policy, which is identical to our policy iteration kind of approach. But here the difference is now that, I go back, that using this direct policy improvement approach on the state values and basically deriving the optimal policy from this explicitly in the very last step, that I can uh, speed up things. And also, in contrast to the policy iteration, I do not need an initial policy, right? So here, what we do is, with value iteration, we do not work with an initial policy, but we basically work with an initial values, and then using one step ahead prediction in order to derive optimal decisions from these values, okay? So this is also very nice. Because in this case, we can just work with arbitrary initial values, like the zero values here again, and can derive from this an implicit policy by one step ahead prediction. Okay, basically, same thing, uh, as I said, just differently implemented in this combined way. Okay, any questions so far to policy and value iteration? So key takeaway messages here so far are policy and value iterations are just a combination of policy evaluation and improvement. We try to improve our predictions, we try to improve our policy, and eventually we'll come up to optimal decision making and the knowledge about the state values about this decision. With further aspects, I would like to basically just come up um, to summarizing the dynamic programming algorithms which we have discussed today. Um, basically, what we can find is that all DP algorithms have polynomial complexity. So, if you want to find the state values V, then you can find that in the worst case, if you cannot utilize any symmetry as within our forest tree MDP, that you will need to evaluate M times N square uh, function evaluations, and M are the number of actions, N are the number of states, and therefore, uh, this is basically a polynomial kind of complexity in order to solve the MDP. So this will also mean that if you have an MDP with a certain number of actions and with a certain number of states, you can get a rough estimate using dynamic programming with policy iteration or value iteration how long it will take you to solve this MDP. Um, of course, if you solve for the state action values, this might be even a little bit higher because you have to uh, solve for all m square action value combinations. But in any case, it is polynomial. We will see, I think, on the next slide that in the case of exhaustive search, where you have to try out in every state all possible state action trajectories, what we will basically would come up in this case would be n to the power of m and therefore we would have some exponential kind of approach for the exhaustive search. But here in the DP algorithm, we come to polynomial complexity, which is of course less. In dynamic programming, we have basically um, discussed two problems, prediction and control. So state value estimation and optimal decision making. For prediction, we have utilized the Bellman expectation equation from last week using the policy evaluation algorithm like the Richardson iteration. For control, using the policy iteration, we have basically combined the Bellman expectation equation and the gradient policy improvement part. And with the value iteration, just using the Bellman optimality equation, we have tried to combine both parts 
where we then directly get optimal decisions from the state value. Okay, therefore I hope from this table it already becomes clear that this MDP structure based on the ideas from Bellman are also the fundamentals of dynamic programming which we have introduced today. However, of course, uh, we have um, indeed improved our um, algorithmic complexity in contrast to uh, exhaustive searches because we only have this polynomial complexity now in M and N. However, it is still a polynomial complexity, right? So let's go back here for state values M times N square. As I've mentioned, if N is a million states, so 10 to the power of 6, and then you need to do this times 2, then it's 10 to the power of 12 operations or evaluations you need to do, and of course, 10 to the power of 12 evaluations using maybe a large um, matrix calculations here and so on. So this will really take forever. So therefore, uh, dynamic programming uses still full width backups. So for each state update, we consider all successor states and all actions which are possible while utilizing this full knowledge of the MDP. So therefore, these updates, even using tricks like the Richardson iteration will become very computational complex because we take into account the entire state space. We try to update the entire state space in one, and this is called, in the context of dynamic programming, the curse of dimensionality. So there will be, given your computational performance, your com computational um, opportunities you have on your personal computer or some HPC center or whatsoever, there will be an upper limit where dynamic programming can be really used in a feasible way because at some point even this polynomial complexity with respect to M and N will become infeasible because you basically need to update the entire state space in one shot. Um, and all the subsequent approaches which we will see during the lecture series, which are data driven, they will also make a big difference here with respect to these uh, full width backups because we will see that the classical reinforcement learning algorithms which are based on data will not require to update all state values in one shot but they can try to you know update and improve like this state decision and then like update and improve this state decision and so on so they can basically try to improve locally whereas dynamic programming as such must always improve globally, and this can lead to increased computational complexity. However, most importantly, also second most important slide for today, you will see this figure also a couple of times throughout the entire lecture series, is that from the policy iteration or value iteration idea, um, which is this combination of improving our policy and improving our value prediction based on this improved policy, which we can also call a generalized policy evaluation. But this idea of running in circles, so improving, predicting, improving, predicting, that this is a very interesting concept which we have introduced in dynamic programming today, GPI, but we will also utilize this concept for all reinforcement learning algorithms, which we will start to introduce next week. So this is a very central concept, and you will see that all of the reinforcement learning algorithms which we will consider are basically are always um, pushing around these two problems here, which is also another viewpoint of somehow the exploration exploitation dilemma in that sense that if I update my policy, right, so if I update my choices, I need to also update my evaluation of the choices, right? So if I decide to go to a new restaurant on Saturday evening, the consequence of this decision is that I also need to evaluate if I like this new restaurant or not, right? So you also have to really go there, invest your time, find out if this was a good restaurant or not. You need to update your evaluation of this decision and then you have invested some time to do so, right? And therefore, the question is like, how much do you update your policy? Because large policy updates, so let's say you do not consider 
to just to go to one new restaurant, but maybe to three new restaurants on the next three weekends, that of course will invest more of your time to evaluate if these restaurants are great or not. And of course, therefore, this is also like decision resource allocation kind of problem that you need to try to switch back between trying new things out, improving your policy, and improving your evaluations regarding these policy changes. Yeah, this pretty much then concludes um, the dynamic programming lecture today. Um, dynamic programming as such is also subject, as I said, to many optimization problems. We have discussed it in the special notion of finite MDPs today. So if you're looking into lecture books, which are somehow related to optimization, model predictive control, operating research, and so on, you will very likely also see dynamic programming chapters, but you might see that the content of this chapter is distinctly different from how we have discussed it today, because we have discussed it in this finite MDP context. Uh, important part of dynamic programming is basically just this idea of breaking down a problem into many subproblems and recaching information from previous solutions. This is the umbrella about all dynamic programming <laughs> solutions, and what we have discussed today is, so to speak, the special variant for finite MDPs. So therefore, don't be irritated if you see, okay, dynamic programming in my lecture book, which I have here on the table, looks completely different from what the guy told me here in the lecture. This is because of the application scope. Any questions? Good. Then, uh, I thank you for your attendance. Uh, we will stop the lecture here. We will have the exercise in the room, I think, behind me. Um, unfortunately, we have the room, I think, available just starting at four sharp. So you will have to do a little break now, uh, maybe get a coffee or something. And then Max will do the exercise with you starting at 4 p.m. or shortly after 4 p.m., depending on when we get there. Okay, then see you next week. <laughs>